just, just curious, how many people here have created a logo? All right, like they have one on their thumb drive or their computer at home. They have a logo that they use for maybe either a business or just for fun. A couple, I think I saw like two hands, two hands. Well, by the end of today, we'll all have a logo. Okay, so that's, that's gonna be today's assignment or exercise will be exercise 16, logo design. So using the tools that we learned today, primarily the Pathfinder tool from Illustrator, we'll all work together to create our own personal logos, okay? Um, but before we do that, let's just kind of get a little grasp on how logos are created, kind of the history of why people created the logo that they have, and we'll also talk about the successes of certain logos. We'll talk about some logos that aren't so successful, why, etc. okay? So that ultimately you guys can all create the most successful logo possible by the end of the class or by the end of Wednesday, I guess I, could, I should say. So what is an effective logo? And like all of our little lists that we create on our lectures, you could probably add probably several more things to this particular list. But uh, and then as we talk about these, we'll also kind of go into into depth on on several of these topics. OK, as we continue. So first, an effective logo is distinctive. OK. It is distinctive, it is appropriate and practical, okay? So most logos usually typically aren't super complex, okay? Um, you'll see a couple examples of some logos today that are very complex, and we'll talk about why it doesn't really work well. Um, but most effective logos are practical. Are they all? Not all, but I'd say a majority are, are fairly straightforward and practical. The reason why is kind of related to the fourth bullet point is, kind of a simplicity of graphics will help make those logos practical. But you also want to be able to use your logo in a variety of, for a variety of different uses, whether it be putting it on a business card or on a t-shirt or on a billboard. So practical logos make for ease of being able to do that. Okay, and we'll, we'll continue on that in a little bit. What's the example? Of, which one? The logo on the screen. Oh, 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 who is this? Well, this is just kind of a, this is kind of a, actually a logo that we'll actually be able to create today. This is a perfect example. Um, I actually don't know who, who this company is, but I know, I was talking to the other teacher about it. He actually was the one that picked out the logo. But I know it has something to do with a four, or it has something to do with the number four. Does anybody else recognize this? I probably know about 90% of the logos that are in the lecture, but there are a few that were just picked out because they're fun and because they're eye-catching or some of them are really small companies though that you know I've never actually heard of but I think they're really successful and they have created a really successful logo so this is kind of one of those examples but this is actually a great example of something that you'll easily be able to create today using just the Pathfinder tool okay so an effective logo is distinctive appropriate practical graphic simple in form and conveys an intended message all right so here's just a couple logos that uh, we should all be familiar with. They're all very iconic. They're all very simple. And they're all very easily recognizable. So this is kind of how, this is really the ultimate success of a logo. Is, okay, if we look at all of these, they've all done their job in all six of those categories. Okay, we look at them all. We have Shell, we have Volkswagen, NBC, Chanel, ABC, most Anybody know that? I'm, most people should, I would guess, probably know this. Maybe some of the younger crowd doesn't know this. Rolling Stones, yeah. A little different from the others in that there's kind of some depth and some kind of glossiness to the tongue. But overall, if we look at Shell, we look at NBC, they're all very simple. They're all very straightforward. But they're all very easily recognizable. You could probably show a majority of these logos to any person on the planet, and they'll likely know... Uh, what it is and what the ultimately the logo stands for okay um, and but most importantly when I look at a lot of these they're all very simple they're all they're all for the most part minus NBC very simple in color very simple in form they could be put on letterhead business cards all of the above no problem um, without any issues so the first one simplicity uh, simplicity is ultimately the easiest way to recognize a logo. So uh, we're gonna look at, actually no, we'll look at it right here. We'll look at here Starbucks here and we'll talk about it a little bit in terms of why it's so recognizable. Um, a simple logo is also versatile, 
okay? When I say versatile, I mean exactly what I said just a few seconds ago in terms of what you're able to do with it, okay? A simple logo is memorable, okay? Like Nike, Coca-Cola, those are all very memorable logos. And especially if we look at the one on the screen. I'm sure we all, I mean, if, if, if someone in here doesn't know what that is, uh, I would be absolutely shocked. But I'm sure probably about half of us probably were here today at some point of the day. I know, I know. How many people were here actually today? Went to this, this place? Oh, come on. Really? <laughs> I'm the only one? I was there like three times today. We have a coffee break every like nine minutes in my office. And it shows. And it shows. <laughs> I've been to coffee today. Um, well, we all know this is the Starbucks logo, but what's really interesting, what's, what's really catching to, to me about this is when I really look at it, even though it's, is, it's as iconic as it really is, I mean, what does, what does the mermaid have to do with coffee? I really have no clue. I think there was actually someone maybe about a year ago that actually knew the answer to this. I'm sure if we actually researched it, there's probably some tie into what the mermaid has to do with the logo, but it's a mermaid that has these arms that kind of have these sleeves and a crown. And ultimately, what does that really have to do with coffee? I, I, I really don't know. But ultimately, it's solved all of those six problems that we, we originally talked about. And lastly, uh, after memorable, it often features something unexpected or unique. I'd say this is probably a really good example of that. This is a little unexpected and it's a little unique. And that's eye-catching to a lot of people, okay? And the next slide that we're gonna look at is another perfect example of eye-catching and unique. Ultimately, you remember this, but it's still very simple. Even though it's kind of out there and we don't really know why the mermaid is on the Starbucks logo, it's very unique and it's very simple and they could put it on anything. So next, this is just kind of a great little, um, great little example, Crocodile. I'm actually not really exactly sure what this company does either. I usually have someone every sem semester ask me what this company does, but it's very memorable and it makes a lot of sense. Very creative. So we have the crocodile, we have the hill. The crocodile is eating the bird. Actually, maybe somebody can look this up and see if it's even a company anymore. I don't know, but maybe we can find this out by the end of the day. So that's crocodile, good logo. Fish bomb, fish bomb, fishing shop. So we have the fish, we have the bomb, we all get it. Easily recognizable, memorable, okay? So second, we have enduring. And the biggest thing about being enduring, and this is ultimately the demise of a lot of logos, or this is a reason why a lot of logos change over time. Apple is a great example of this, and we'll actually look at the history of the Apple logo in here in just a few minutes. But you have to think to yourself, when you are creating your logo, does it stand the test of time, okay? If you create this logo today, is it captivating to today's younger generation, older generation? Uh, and it, will it do the, will it ask the same questions and solve the same problems in 10, 20, or even 50 plus years, okay? And usually simplicity uh, really helps create that enduring aspect of it, okay? So, and, and uh, color has a lot to do with it. We'll actually have um, a lecture all about color, I believe, actually next class, Wednesday. So in two days, we'll talk all about color and what that means and what it has to do with logo design. Uh, so, so that's color, but ultimately, does your logo stand uh, the test of time? Is it future-proof? If you show this in 50 years, assuming Twitter is still a company, uh, I, guess, I guess we'll see. Um, assuming Twitter is still a company, will this still be an effective logo in that length of time, okay? So when you're creating something, that you might think of something that's really fun right now and you might ultimately really, really like it, but think about who your audience is and think about who your audience might be in 10 or 20 years, okay? You don't want it to be offensive, you don't want it to be a variety of different things. You want it to be easily recognizable by all people, okay? Regardless of, of, of who they are, okay? Don't follow fads. So just because it's in right now, doesn't mean you, it will be in in five or 10 or 20 years, okay? So just because it's really popular, don't base your logo just off of that. Okay, it's also important to create a logo uh, that can be transformed over time. Okay, we'll talk about, I think there's an example later on in the presentation about the logo for Mall of America. 
Okay, Apple's another great example and how they've transformed over years and years and years and years. They, also, they originally started as fairly simple, but they've been able to, you know, every five or 10 years rebrand themselves but ultimately still sticking to the original logo and the original concept. So can it shift and change over time? Okay, so here's that nice little that nice little Apple Apple demonstration. So believe it or not, this is what Apple ultimately started with, okay? It's uh, it's a nice little insignia. It says Apple uh, Apple Computer Company. There's a little picture of Sir Isaac Newton in the background sitting underneath a tree. I mean, could, could we really imagine that being on the back of our iPhones? No way. No, we absolutely could not. So that, but that's, most people didn't, you know, I, I actually didn't even know this until probably three or four years ago either, but that's what the Apple logo ultimately started at. It didn't last too long. And then, then came a guy named Steve Jobs and he created this first logo. So the Able, the Able, the Rainbow Apple logo. So that was used from 1976 uh, all the way up until 1998. It actually lasted a pretty long time. That lasted almost 20 years, okay? Um, I'm not sure if everyone here ultimately remembers that. Some of you may be a, a little young, but I'd say probably most of us at least were, were young when this happened. I actually remember when my mom, she, she went to school in college for graphic design, for newspaper design, okay? And I remember it as a kid, my first Apple computer showing up to our to our house and this apple computer was came in a box that was about as tall as i was it was about four feet tall and it was about this big around and i remember this giant colorful logo on it and i opened it up and the thing was bright blue it was bright blue and there was our first apple computer i was probably like maybe uh that's probably about 10 at that time maybe yeah, that's probably about 10 when i first saw that logo but it's ultimately super recognizable i remember that thing coming to our house to this day and I always will. So ultimately that logo, that colorful logo, stood the test of time. But then it became 1998. I think just a couple of years before that, Steve Jobs left the company. Apple, if you don't remember, uh, they almost went under. They were, they were just a couple months away from not being a company anymore in about 1998. They had way too many products. Um, they all were, you know, everyone didn't, didn't quite understand them the way that they ultimately are very successful for understanding now. But then Apple hired back Steve Jobs, I think just around 1998, and he came back and he reinvented the company and he simplified it, okay? So they got rid of a lot of the products they part and they focused on just a couple of them, okay? And they ultimately reinvented the logo to the monochrome Apple logo, which was used from 98 to 2000, okay? This is probably what we're most familiar with now and as even though this 2007 to present logo, that is not correct, that's probably about 2007 to about 2014 or 15. Uh, but in 2001 to 2007, they incorporated a stylized Apple logo. So we start to include this idea of glossiness to the logo. It's not really used anymore. And I think I made a comment earlier in the semester that the glossy kind of look to things, the gradient look is not really so much in. We've definitely moved back to this idea right here, okay? But for about 10 years or so, we used this idea of a glossy or stylized logo. There was shadow, there was gloss, there was depth to what they were, uh, to what people wanted to show. And you still see it a little bit today, but I'd say predominantly not, okay? So the final logo was uh, used right here, 2007 to about 2015. And then ultimately, now we're actually back to a logo exactly like this, the very monochrome gray and white Apple logo, very simple and monochromatic. And that's kind of where we are today in the terms of logo design. And we'll finish out the lecture with looking at about 10 or 15 slides from more modern day present logos of things that are successful today. All right. So then we have the logo design process. And you'll notice that this is very familiar to the overall graphic design process that we talked about earlier in the semester, okay? We have the design brief where you're talking to your client about uh, why they need the logo. You might talk to them about their budget, um, what ultimately their vision is, etc. So very similar to what we talked about earlier in the semester. Research, uh, this is a great time. And actually research and reference are, are very similar categories. They kind of overlap a lot. And you'll see a diagram that shows that in a sec. 
But this is the time when you're ultimately looking at other logos. Maybe it be uh, your competitor's logo. What makes them really successful? What are other people in the industry doing? Um, if I look at a lot of architecture firms' logos, they're actually, in my opinion, they're all kind of boring. They're all very simple. But um, you know, they're mostly composed of letters. It's just the acronym for, uh, for whatever the firm founders are or something like that. So what are people in your industry doing? What are your competitors doing? It's good to kind of understand what's successful and what's not. What, you know, if you look back to the history of people in your industry, what was really successful and what's not successful, okay? That's why we take history classes. That's why we take architectural history classes so that we know about what people did in the past, why it really worked, why do people still do it today? Why don't they do it today? So that's gonna all occur during the research and reference phase. The next phase, phase number four, sketching and conceptualizing. This is probably the largest phase or the longest phase of the six. This is when you're, this is when you're coming together with your coworkers, when you're starting to sketch out and conceptualize what the logo is gonna look like, okay? You're starting to get to that first step of understanding what that final product might eventually be, okay? And we're gonna look at an example here in a sec of that process and how it might start, okay? Everyone's a little bit different. Everyone has their own method of how they might do that, but we'll look at an example. Number five, we have reflection, okay? This is the time when you might go back to your design brief. You might look at your questions that you asked your client, what they answered to you. And you might ask yourself, am I still solving the problems that my client originally wanted, okay? And as we work on today's assignment, you can actually kind of pretend that maybe you're the person sitting next to you is your client. You might talk to them. We'll just pretend you have an unlimited budget, even though it's never the case. Actually, usually what happens, they say, I have a $100,000 budget, and then in two weeks, it's 10 grand or something like that. They always cut the budget in about by about 75%. But you might pretend today when you guys are creating your logo is pretend maybe the person next to you is your client or yourself is your client and start to go through these, you know, and maybe a shortened version. You might go through this process uh, step by step. And then lastly, we have the presentation where you are going to present this to your client. You're going to tell them why it's successful or why you believe it's going to be successful. And you might show them a variety of different medias that they might ultimately present it on. Okay. I'll show, I'll show an example of that as well in a sec. So here's that little graph that I just mentioned. This is, these are all the different steps, including just a couple others as well. Actually, some of the steps are just kind of broken down into kind of another similar step. But you can kind of get an idea of how they all relate to each other. Each one of these circles is a representation of time, okay? So you can see that the project brief takes a little bit less time than maybe the research, okay? The project brief is usually just kind of consisting of a bunch of questions. That doesn't usually take too long. You can usually solve it all in a, you know, in a meeting or two. But you can see that the sketching and conceptualization process of logo design is the largest and, and probably the most important. This is the time when you're sketching it. You might do four, five, six examples of what that logo might look like. You might draw one, you might crumple it up and throw in the, in the trash can and start all over and do that 10 times. It's all a part of the process, just like if you are an architect and you know doing architectural drawings. So here's an example of what that design process might look like, okay? And this is going to be from the very beginning portions of conceptualization, okay? Here you could see that you know the first idea might be this hand or this fist, okay? Uh, it's very clear, it's a photograph of that fist. Maybe somebody or whoever started designing this logo uh, thought, hey, I kinda, I'm kind of on to something here. I like this idea. They probably have some thoughts in their head in terms of what the final product might look like. Okay, And so from there, they took it on to the next step, which was to start to put that on paper. Start to put some lead to the paper and start to draw out uh, what it might look like. But you can see here, that it's still pretty rough. It's still not really a logo, okay? It's very much a sketch uh, and it's not simple enough. If somebody wanted to put this on a t-shirt, it wouldn't work well, okay? We have too many little lines. 
uh, that would ultimately make the process really difficult. So it has to be conceptualized even more and simplified even more. So if you look back at those six original steps that we talked about, we haven't quite met about five of them. Maybe one of them at this particular stage, okay? You can see here that it's starting to simplify a little bit more, okay? The hand has turned just a little bit. Our lines are getting a little bit straighter. We're starting to break the hand down into some more simpler shapes, okay? We're starting to get some kind of rounded off rectangles that start to form the, the knuckles and the fingers of the hand. But we're still very sketchy. We're not really solving all of the problems yet. Okay, so here's that same hand simplified even more. All right, so the hand is simplified even more. Now we're definitely into some very basic shapes, okay? All of the fingers or all the, the knuckles are very much repetitive of each other and uh, we're starting to get quite a bit more repetition, okay? But we're still very sketchy. We still have a lot of shadow, a lot of gradient. Okay, so here is where we start to turn that sketch into being a little bit digital, all right? So this is uh, actually definitely a much older version of, of Illustrator, but still very much works exactly the same as what we'll learn today, okay? So they started with just a basic rectangle and they went up to your uh, their toolbar and they added the rounded corners tool, okay? Where they rounded the corners of the rectangle to start to get some of these shapes that they were originally envisioning, okay? And then we have something that looks a little bit like this. Now we're into that very monochromatic look where we're down to just simple uh, blocks of color and very simple shapes. Now we're starting to solve probably, we could probably argue we're solving all of our original problems, all of those six fundamentals that we talked about from the very beginning. Okay, it's very simple. Uh, it's easy to use. It's starting to be fairly recognizable. I don't know if it's as recognizable as it could be quite yet. But for the most part, we're starting to solve a lot of those issues, okay? A little bit more tweak, a little bit more articulation. All right, we're starting to add some of the finer details. Okay, they've turned that stroke of that bottom finger to white so that the spacing in between the fingers is the same as the, red, the other fingers. And we're very close to the final product. All right, we're starting to add some text, some details. And this is also gonna be the point where, all right, I'm about 90% done. This is when you might start to experiment with different colors. You might start to uh, tweak it a little bit and so that you have four or five different variations. Once you know you're about 90% there, you like the overall forms, you like what you're seeing, but let's make about five different versions to see what the client might like. All right, so this is a good example of what you might present to the client. So they might say, okay, this is, uh, this is what we're thinking for you. We have the fist, we have the monochromatic color, and we have the LTD, okay? And then they also show it in grayscale and just black and white. And this is actually a part of today's exercise in that you're going to have to create a logo that is color, but it also works really well in grayscale and black in a black version, okay? The reason why is let's just say you have a really nice logo, there's some good color pop into it, and it looks really nice. But ultimately, somebody might print out your proposal or that logo is on your letterhead, and they might be on a black and white printer. They may not have color, but they're just gonna print it out, and you wanna know that that logo is still gonna look really good, regardless of what the color is, okay? Whether it be black and white, grayscale, or color. So that's part of today's exercise in, is to think about what your logo is going to look like in all three versions and you'll need to uh, show that. All right. This is also a part of the presentation process where they maybe show your logo on a variety of different medias. So they're showing that logo on maybe some company letterhead. They're showing the logo and some other branding pieces as a part of maybe some company envelopes or something like that. And they're also showing it on some business cards. All right, so you're showing that the logo is not only effective looking at it by itself, but the logo is also really effective including it into a variety of other marketing pieces. All right, so it's all a part of, of, of the process, not just designing the logo, but also designing all of the other individual pieces that might go along with it. Okay, 
So that first stage that we talked about earlier is the design brief. This is where you question the client. For today, that might be yourself about the intended use or purpose of the logo, okay? What is gonna be the purpose of the logo? Are they gonna be putting it on, uh, are they gonna be putting it on, you know, is it just gonna be on letterhead? Is it gonna be on business cards? Or is it gonna be on packaging? Is it gonna be on a billboard, okay? Depending on what you're gonna use it for, you might think about designing that logo a little bit differently. Okay, be certain to include where it's going to be used. Okay, we already talked about that a little bit. This is also a great time to, to discuss fees and costs. So next we have the research phase. What industry does this logo belong in? Okay, is it going to be a part of an architecture logo, personal landing page, etc.? What other logos are used in this industry? Okay, so this is a great time to research other companies that have similar logos. What is the history of the previous logos? For those of you that are in the architecture program here, you might have created a logo for Arky 130. Did you guys create one already? Yeah, so this might be a good time for those of you that maybe have done that. You can either continue on what you guys started. Uh, it's quite possible that what you created at that time, you probably are disgusted by it now. I know I look back at a lot of what I created five years ago or 10 years ago, and I'd probably do it completely different today. So it's a great time to improve that and make it a little bit better. Um, if you haven't done that yet, or you can complete, or or you can create something that's completely new. What are your competitors using for their logos? Reference. This is a great time to look into successful logo designs. So when you think of competitors, what are your competitors' logos doing, and why are they successful? You can also look at competitors that have, uh, or maybe aren't quite so much competitors, but just companies in general that are really successful, and why are their logos really successful? Okay, so ask yourself those questions. What are the current styles being used? Are the styles today flat or are they 3D? Okay, if we ask that question today, they're definitely flat. They're definitely not on the 3D side. Is uh, what you're proposing trendy? Trendy is good, people like trendy, but you wanna make, make sure that your logo stands the test of time. Okay, so sometimes too trendy is sometimes not a good thing because too trendy is not going to be trendy likely in probably five years but stuff that's timeless will always always work so you can even think about the same thing in terms of clothing what are some pieces of clothing that you know you would you, you probably absolutely loved five years ago but you wouldn't be caught dead wearing today and what are the ones that you wore 10 years ago that you would still absolutely wear today so you can have to ask yourself the same kind of questions when you're creating your logo so sketch, or sketching and conceptualizing. Develop multiple logo design concepts. So explore a variety of ideas and trust your intuition. So I'll bring up this idea of intuition all throughout the entire semester. Okay, so listen to your thoughts. Listen to what your overall ideas are telling you or what your, what your mind and your body is telling you. Okay, so listen to that intuition. So this is a great time to explore multiple design concepts. Create multiple varieties of what your, what your thought is. You might like what the first one you might make and you're gonna say, yeah, this is actually great. I don't have any reason why I would really change it. But I promise you, if you create three or four iterations of that logo, you'll likely at least find some other part of another logo that you created that you like a little bit better. So it's great to just do multiple iterations. Remember to fall back on your research and reference steps. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. So go back and, and look at the different questions that you asked your employer or your client and make sure that you're still following all of those, all of those same comments. All right, so here's a, here's a great example of kind of that early conceptualization. Here's some good sketches. And I'd highly recommend today when you're creating your own logo, don't be afraid to pull out some paper, okay? Don't go right into the digital, the digital method. It's probably the biggest, if I ask my boss what's the you know, biggest thing that he hates about the newest generation in terms of architectural design, it's that people just dive right into the computer. And I partially agree. I was, I was right in that generation where when I was going to school, they actually made me draw everything by hand for the first year. And then they said, okay, you're really not gonna do that probably for the rest of your life. Now you can go digital but I still have a really strong appreciation for hand-drawn stuff, and I still do it. I, I, I still have no problem hand-sketching an idea 
whether it be a logo or a piece of graphic or it be a building, I will always start with some scratch paper and do some, uh, some quick design concepts because stuff like this that you see on the screen, you can probably draw one of these little, one of these little concepts in about 30 seconds, whereas I promise you, you can't do a digital version of that in 30 seconds. It'll take you far, far more time, okay? Especially if you're gonna create you know, 30 or 40 different examples. Okay, and uh, you know something that I actually get a lot of comments back from my clients in terms of hand sketches. We always start our design process in our office. Actually, relating this, you know, having nothing to do with logos, is we always try to start our design process doing hand sketch elevations. My boss takes a lot of pride in doing those hand sketch hand sketch elevations. And what's nice about them is they're rough. They're not super rigid, and that it allows the viewer to kind of use their imagination to kind of fill in the blanks. So they're not thinking it doesn't look so final, it doesn't look like that's what we've picked. You know, it still allows there to be some interpretation on what it might look like. So that's why we like to sketch things. So and here's how that here's how that same sketch ended up turning into the final product. So actually this is multiple versions of the final product or how maybe that product uh, transformed over a number of years okay you can see here that this one has some shadow it has some gradient uh, still a good logo I could I could see this possibly happening today but I would say it's not so much on what's really trendy today I'd say it's probably changed since then okay same thing with this multiple colors it's probably transformed so here's a here's a few slides on just kind of going through that design process how it might have worked started with the very basic simple lines and illustrator we added some color we added some gradients we got some nice pop okay notice how crisp and firm all of these lines are this is a good example of a nice vector image okay so that they can make this as large or as small as they want to without any distortion at all okay so that's a great thing to see when you're creating a logo all right, so this is a nice example of, okay, I've created my logo, but I also have some text. Well, what's the correct font for my logo? All right, you might like the font that you initially created. You know, you started scrolling down that list in Illustrator or InDesign and, and uh, you know, you said that looks good, but try the same logo with five different fonts. See how it looks. You'd be really surprised on, <coughs> excuse me, You'll be really surprised on how your thoughts change when you actually see it in different ways. And this is when you start to actually look at the really fine details of your logo too. You're getting to the point where you're looking about, you're looking at how the letters maybe intersect or interact with each other, okay? Some of these are really good. Some of these, you know, are a little bit different and aren't, you know, and don't quite react the way that you, maybe you like them to, okay? vivid ways color in your life so really the color for this particular logo is really a part of what they do as a firm this, this firm uh, specializes in in, in in colorful and actually specializes in graphics so uh, the color is important to what they do in terms of showing that but then you take that same graphic you put it over black, okay? So what is my graphic gonna look like if you put it over just pure black? Well, it still works, or it's still easily transformable, so that you know maybe they you know didn't didn't look like they had to transform this portion at all, but they maybe just change the color of the of the text. Still works really well. They make it all gray. Yeah, still works good. Still easily recognizable. Okay, I think this is step four. All right, so this is when you're gonna step away from your work and then revisit it with a fresh perspective. Earlier in the semester, I talked about uh, the idea of letting go of your design and starting all over. Okay, so this is a great time to just step away. Maybe you start to ask your neighbors or your colleagues, ask them for their opinions, and you start to really fine tune it. Is this really what you want, okay? And so it's a great time to step away and revisit it with a fresh perspective. Ask your neighbors or your, or, their, or your colleagues for their opinions, okay? Today you might ask the people sitting right next to you. You might ask myself, okay? And start to receive feedback and let the ideas mature, okay? 
Um, something that we actually really highly recommend, especially in our office, especially when it comes down to like really important big proposals, um, is we might create that proposal today and tomorrow, but before sending it out, we're gonna let it sit. We're gonna let it sit overnight. I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna look at it in the morning. Even though I'm really excited about it, I like it, I'm not gonna send it out to the client quite yet. I'm just gonna let it sit, let it just kind of fester in my mind, come back in the morning and revisit it. Do I still really like it? And I'd be honest, probably about 50% of the time, we make some changes the next day after you've, you've sat on it and uh, you're not really excited, you know, you're not as excited about it anymore. You probably have a different opinion the following day. All right, so let your ideas mature. This is one of my favorite favorite logo, logos. I don't think this is even. I don't think this is a company more anymore. But um, very successful logo. Grab it. Two hands. The intersection. That void space of the hands. The rabbit. Very clever. I gotta say, if you think of something like this, that's uh, you know, in my ideas, that's that's like a million dollar logo. You're a great great graphic artist if if you start to put two and two together. This is, uh, I think, a Japanese beer company. Okay, so lastly, last the last uh, topic, presentation. So this is where you're gonna be where you start to, you gather up all your ideas, you put it in presentation form, and you show it to the client. This is where you distill the best ideas and make a final version of the logo for your client. In today's case, this is gonna be you. If the client doesn't like it, you're gonna go back and repeat all of the process over again, okay? And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a part of the design process. I mean, nobody likes a little bit of rejection, but it's a part of the design process. It's okay, especially if you're the client and it's your money, it's okay to say, you know what? I really, I actually really like it. Well, let's go back and let's just do a couple more versions of this. Can we make it a little bit better? Okay, so I wouldn't, uh, I, would, I would certainly recommend, if, even when you like it at the end of the day, to, uh, to try again, okay? Go back and repeat the steps that you just went through. All right, this is another example, uh, very similar to, um, was there one in the past that we, we saw that in? Very simple to the multiple different versions, okay, and how you're gonna use it. This is maybe something that you might present to the client. Okay, here's my Mall of America logo, right up here, all right? This is how it looks, you know, most days, but what else can I do with that logo? All right, we move over, we might have some different banners. You might create some banners very similar, just breaking down the logo that you've already created, and you start to create these different banners or these different ribbons, okay? And you can see how that, that might be used in a variety of different ways. What is our color palette? Okay, well, here's our color palette. You're gonna save that, and you might uh, use that in future iterations of the logo. Here's my typography. This might be a time when you either have to create your own typography, and people do that. You think of like Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is not just a font. The Coca-Cola font is not just a font that you can find on Microsoft Word. If you were to type something using the Coca-Cola font, um, people are gonna look at that and say, that looks like Coca-Cola. Uh, another example of that is like Ross Dress for Less. You can actually go online and download the Ross Dress for Less font. It's a font. They created it themselves, and it's now iconic for being uh, that particular brand. So we move down even more. We have seasonal identities. So how might you transform that logo depending on the season? Independence Day, Valentine's Day, Christmas, New Year's. I guess that's also maybe New Year's. But then you might have some different patterns, whether it be wrapping paper. Maybe the Mall of America makes their own wrapping paper that they're gonna sell to their tenants that they're gonna use to wrap the different gifts. But you can kind of get the idea that you want your logo to be multifunctional. You want to be able to transform it and create multiple uh, versions of that logo for possibly different times of the year. Learn from others. What brands succeeded and why? We all know this logo. We all know this is Nike. Uh, this logo hasn't changed a bit since they first started, okay? This is the way that I remember it, is as young as I can possibly, as far as I can go back, all 30 years of my life. This is exactly the way that it's always been, and it likely always will be. But it's very iconic and it's very simple. It's very easily recognizable. 
Uh, I think I actually watched a documentary, and I wonder if anyone else has seen this, where they took a couple of the most iconic brands. I think one was Coca-Cola, one was Nike. Um, I think those were the two main brands. And they went to some of the deepest parts of the earth, places where they have like indigenous tribes of like African plains, where these people don't see anyone but themselves. You know, maybe they might see someone else other than their own tribe mates you know, once every five years or something like that. And they went over to these people and they all knew what it was. Even though they don't wear clothes or they just have their own things that they've made for themselves, but they knew what these logos were. And they did that in like five different places all over the world and they all knew the Nike logo and they all knew Coca-Cola. So it's, a, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing about how successful some of these are. So as we move towards the end, we're gonna then talk about typography. We're gonna have some logos that are only typography, okay? You're not gonna have anything but the typography. So this is critical for some logos when the only thing that is contained is text and characters, okay? So when you have things like this, uh, it's really important to determine what's the right font, okay? Because this is what your logo is. Your logo is the font. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, when I talked about earlier about creating your own font, will create their own font if this is the case, okay? Um, partly the reason being is that they don't want other people to be able to easily replicate it, okay? You don't want someone to be able to go, okay, uh, Arial, bold, and that's my, you know, that's my, uh, the letters in my logo. Well, that's easily, uh, you can easily replicate that. So that's, you know, could be a good option. It's timeless, aerial, bold might be real timeless, but ultimately you wanna create something that really pops and stands out. Will the font go out of style? So for example, if someone created a logo, which I'm sure lots of people did a long time ago using the, the, the papyrus font, okay? Um, you know, it's not in style anymore. A lot of people look at that and say, wow, that's, that's dated. That's the first thing that comes to my mind when I see that. I can't, I can't even really say I've seen it though in quite some time. Does the font reflect the client or the business? So for example, you look at the one over here on the right, Fontello. This is actually a company that creates fonts for you. So yeah, it absolutely ties into uh, what they do as a business. They create fonts. So their logo just happens to be made out of just, just font. That's what their logo is. You may have to make your own to get the better results. Remember to load custom fonts as necessary. Uh, this is a great time when you start to look at the little details. We talked about kerning, tracking, and all of those little details when we talked about typography. Those things absolutely matter when it comes to, to font. And actually my company's logo, FCGA Architecture, this is a great example of that. Um, I, when I originally recreated the logo about five years ago, um, you know, I broke it down into the individual letters. We actually found a font that's not a font that you could find on your computer. Um, and I started to, you know, create all the letters individually. I started to overlap them. They all kind of overlap each other just a little bit, but the look is extremely different. Just separating the letters by, you know, an eighth of an inch. The look is a lot different. So it makes a huge difference when you start to pay attention to the little details. Okay. These are some good examples of some font based logos that we're all recognized with FedEx, IBM, Coca-Cola. CNN, Disney, NASA. Does everyone know the, the FedEx logo trick? Everyone know what makes the FedEx logo really, really special? I think I, you've, you've probably seen this before, a lot of you. Is anyone, does anyone not know? It's gonna blow your mind. I can't wait to tell you if you don't know. Well, if you don't know, I know no one's gonna raise their hand because I don't want to be the one person that doesn't know. It's okay. It's the little arrow right in between the E and the X. So if you don't know that, I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but it's that little white arrow between the E and the X. Yeah, that guy is probably a multimillionaire today. Hopefully, I mean, because he has created probably up there in the top five most iconic logos of all time. Okay, or definitely in the top, you know, maybe dozen or something like that. So yeah, that little arrow between the E and the X, there it is. I think that's about it. I'm just gonna go through some few more examples. Oh, another good slide. Avoid cliches. 
okay? Don't use clip art, okay? Everyone has probably at one point, I know I definitely did it when I was younger, I started with Microsoft Word, I created my own logo and I downloaded the clip art from Microsoft Word. Just remember when you do something like that, that everybody on the world who has Microsoft Word has those images. Every, you know, everyone has used them at some point in time. So avoid clip art. Don't use things like light bulbs for ideas or globes for international. It's very cliche and everybody does it, okay? And you see it and you're like, oh yeah, I've seen that a million times, okay? Don't copy another logo. It will be obvious. Logos have to be unique and have to be successful. Yeah? What are globes used for some of the most successful international companies currently, like Bechtel and Universal? Um, yes, I'm not saying that all are not successful. I'm not saying it's an absolute no-no, but if you go back to the last point, it's been done before. Like people, there are companies that are very recognizable, like Universal, who have done this before. But it also depends on, uh, it depends on what your, you know, what you're doing it for. Universal has nothing to do with really a globe. They picked a globe because that was what they wanted to help brand them at that particular time but you're not like a global company that is using a globe for their logo so have people done it in the past and been successful yes but i would say a majority or several most of the companies that try doing that over and over and over and over again you know it's not it's not going to have the same effect as the person who did it the first time because it's the obvious choice it's the first thing that someone who maybe is not a graphic designer they think of that Oh, a light bulb. Well, it has something to do with ideas. So, but everybody does that. Everyone thinks that way. So, output files uh, for a PNG. We will, we'll talk about this a little bit more. I'm not going to go into a ton on this uh, PNG. We're going to want to create that 1,500 pixels by 1,500 pixels or 300 DPI. This is great for print. Okay. Uh, we also have JPEG formats. Uh, we're going to output our files today as both of these. But something important about these two file types is they're not vector images. So ideally, you're going to have vector and raster versions of your file. The reason being is a lot of people can't open an Adobe Illustrator file, okay, which is going to be your main vector source of your logo. Surprisingly, I mean, most people can open up PDFs these days. PDFs are, can be vector files, but there are still a lot of people that can't open PDFs either. A lot of times, you know, even some of these computers here at school, they don't have like, Adobe PDF, and they're opened up by like a browser you know, PDF viewer or something like that. So it's good to have both the raster and the vector version of these, of your files. Just gonna go through a few logos, what were successful at that time. It's a good one, that one. So hopefully some of these will maybe help create some, some inspiration, kind of give you some ideas, some thoughts in terms of what you might do today. I never got the underground one. Um, I never understood that one. Good idea. I think it has something to do with the sign. Does anybody know maybe more about the history of this logo? Yeah, I could start to see some of the correlations to it, but I'm not, I'm actually not super familiar with the company there, so I can't, I could see some of the relations to what they, it's the part of London. It's the what? Part of London. Oh, right, right, right. Well, yeah, I could see some of the connections to, you know, to, to what they do, but yeah, I'm not sure exactly. Can't answer the question perfectly. Jigsaw, so here's some great examples of some early sketches. Ultimately, the transformation, the evolution of the logo over time. So it started very three-dimensional, lots of shadows. It started to be simplified. This is another thing that I still see a lot of people doing today, having the different color stroke to the body of their of the color of their text. You really don't see that a lot anymore. This is this was like a mid uh, 2000s thing that a lot of people did. You see it a little bit today, but for the most part, we're definitely 
uh, into the more monotone look so you don't have the two different colors in the text. But as you can see here, as we continue to go through, it continues to simplify. We're more monochromatic. This is a really nice version of it in grayscale. It's not as loud. Here's another way that it may be transformed over time. They're starting to incorporate, they're still continuing to incorporate the idea of the puzzle piece. It's always gonna be a staple part of their logo. And that's it. All right, so that's it for today's logo lecture. Any questions about that at all? Comments? Anything at all? All right, perfect, 7.30. Let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at 7.40. And then we're gonna go ahead and jump into Illustrator. We're gonna talk about the Pathfinder tool. We'll create a couple logos and then we'll let you loose to start creating your own logo.